Here's something that everyone at the SCP Foundation knows. Portals to another world located in Indiana are incredibly bad news. The best example being SCP-2935, the limestone cavern in Indiana that leads to a dimension where all life has ended and death reigns supreme. So considering the importance of keeping things like this under control, we've decided to fire up the Anomatron 6000 and simulate sending one of the Foundation's most reliable senior researchers, Dr. Charles Ogden Gears, to investigate another dimensional anomaly, this time in a little town called Hawkins, Indiana. Can Dr. Gears in his younger years hold his own against the Demogorgon, Demodogs, the Mind Flayer, and even Vecna himself? Let's fire up the machine and find out. It was November of 1983, and Dr. Gears awoke to a call on his home phone. Ordinarily, he liked to start his day with a cold shower and a cup of plain black coffee, but on this particular very early morning, he was yanked out of a lovely dreamless sleep by the sound of his superior at the SCP Foundation. Gears, there's something strange going on in this town in Indiana. We're putting together a task force, and you're going to lead it. What's been going on? We don't know much yet, but there have been reports of strange noises, unusual activity, and a local kid's gone missing. That was all Dr. Gears needed to hear. All right, we'll start packing. He placed the phone back in the receiver, brewed himself that cup of coffee, hopped in the shower, and filled a suitcase with all of his usual necessities. Flannel pajamas, five white lab coats, plain slacks and shirts, and one pair of sensible shoes. He dressed in an identical outfit to the ones lining the inside of his slate gray suitcase, combed his hair, and straightened his tie, and that was that. He was ready for whatever awaited him on this new mission. When the official SCP Foundation-issued transportation came to pick him up, one of the task force members handed him a dossier and a thermos filled with more coffee, enough to sustain him for the drive. So, Dr. Gears flipped open the file, taking a look inside. Where are we headed? Don't know too much about it, sir, the man shrugged. Some little podunk place called Hawkins. Dr. Gears spent the drive to Hawkins, Indiana, looking over the few details the Foundation knew so far. Their interest had been piqued when a young boy, Will Byers, disappeared mysteriously on a bike ride home from a friend's house. In addition to the missing persons report, townspeople had called the authorities to complain about strange noises, and there were rumors of a secret research project being conducted by the U.S. government in the area. All of these factors combined to make Hawkins a potential hotbed for anomalous activity and a place of significant interest to the SCP Foundation. Dr. Gears would be tasked with setting up a temporary Foundation site in town, disguised as the headquarters of a new landscaping business, and leading a group of researchers in the investigation of the buyer's disappearance, as well as cataloging other potential anomalies present in the town. They were to remain there indefinitely, and to ensure their work would not be compromised, they were given strict instructions not to draw any unnecessary attention to themselves, from civilians or operatives from any government organizations with an established presence in the town. As Dr. Gears and his team rolled into the town, he was struck by how completely, absolutely ordinary it was. They passed the town hall, the library, a general store, a movie theater, one sleepy little pub packed with a few regulars, a hunting and camping supply store, a few diversions for the kids and young at heart like the arcade, schools, all hallmarks of classic American small town normalcy. As they drove out into the forest around the town, however, away from the friendly veneer of suburbia, Dr. Gears spotted something unusual, something he made a note of the second he caught a glimpse of it. There was a large, official-looking building, surrounded by barbed wire and armed military guards. What's that there? He asked one of his assistants. Uh, Hawkins National Laboratory, she replied. Says here they're under the jurisdiction of the Department of Energy. Hmm, was all he said. He would make sure to send someone out to investigate once they were all settled properly. After several years at the Foundation, he had something of a sixth sense for detecting things that didn't seem to belong. This place was not what it claimed to be. By nightfall, Dr. Gears and his team of six officers had settled into their Foundation-provided housing, located across the street from their front business. Privately, Dr. Gears hoped that the people of Hawkins weren't especially interested in landscaping. He didn't know a damn thing about hedges or whatever else that job entailed. While the SCP Foundation maintained a steady, quiet presence in Hawkins, the anomalous activity only escalated. 
there were reports of a monster, a giant horrible thing with a humanoid build and a face like an open flower filled with teeth. Dr. Gears and four members of the team attempted to track down one of these creatures, hoping to bring it into custody and study it up close. And outside of the home of the missing boy, they finally came face to face with the thing. The predatory creature was tall and thin, with elongated limbs ending in sharp claws. It reminded Dr. Gears a bit of an anomaly he had seen in passing, though he had never seen that thing's face. This beast, however, gave him an up-close and personal look. At first glance, its head looked like the closed bud of a flower, with no discernible features. However, as it prepared to attack, letting out an unearthly screech, fleshy powers unfurled, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth and a gaping maw of a mouth. The officers opened fire immediately, but their bullets did little to deter the advancing creature. They only seemed to make it angry. Before they could apprehend the creature, or more likely find themselves pulled into its wide open mouth, they were interrupted by a group of surprisingly enterprising children, luring it away, seeming to trap it. Two teenage boys and a girl managed to light the beast on fire and send it retreating back to wherever it came from. Dr. Gears and his men stayed out of sight as one of them remarked, I guess the children really are our future. Meanwhile, the other two officers were following up on reports of a strange girl appearing in town as if from nowhere. It was difficult to separate rumor from reality amidst talk of secret government mind experiments, roving gangs of children, and something to do with Ego Waffles, but they managed to trace the person of interest to the local middle school. Yes. They arrived at the middle school just in time to watch the girl use apparent psychic abilities to fend off government operatives before the same monster arrived to massacre the men as the two operatives watched from a distance, hidden just out of sight. They prepared to apprehend the monster and administer amnestics to the children present, but before they could, the girl and the monster were gone. Shortly after this incident, Will Byers was reportedly returned to his home but Dr. Gears couldn't leave Hawkins just yet, not with so many new questions unanswered. Where had the buyer's boy been all this time? What was the creature they had encountered? Where had it come from? What had that unusually powerful girl done with it? And most importantly, would more follow in the beast's footsteps, coming to snatch more children from the streets? With authorization from the SCP Foundation, Dr. Gears reached out to Dr. Owens at the Mysterious Laboratory. He offered to share the information they had managed to gather, if Dr. Owens would provide him with full transparency and do the same. Owens was hesitant, but after being subjected to one of Dr. Gears' trademark hour-long lectures consisting of reasoned, logical, extremely dry arguments, he relented. Dr. Gears celebrated this little triumph, and Dr. Owens reported a persistent headache after listening to the other man prattle on for such a long time. Dr. Gears and his team now had concrete information to share with their higher-ups at the Foundation. They learned all about the gateway to another world that the scientists had opened at the lab, the creatures that had come through its supernatural doorway and the connection to the psychic girl that had disappeared at the middle school. Now that an open line of communication had been established, Dr. Gears was working to convince Owens and the rest of the scientists at the lab to allow him to use their portal. It was his intention to take his team of six operatives through the gateway into this other world. There, he would be able to create a first-hand report for the Foundation, allowing them to categorize the various creatures inside, and perhaps the strange new dimension itself. However, just after Dr. Owens and his staff agreed to allow an SCP Foundation expedition into the Upside Down, as it was colloquially called, Disaster Struck. A presence from the other side of the gate used the buyer's boy to infiltrate the laboratory, dispatching a group of juvenile creatures to attack the scientists there. Dr. Gears was inside when it happened, looking through some of the official reports he had been granted access to. Suddenly, there were sounds of chaos from down the hall, shrieks of terror and agony. He peered through the window of the room to see quadrupedal, almost canine variations of the larger monster bounding down the hallway, leaving a trail of blood in their wake. Remembering his commitment to avoid involving himself unless absolutely necessary, Dr. Gears barricaded the door and hid from the creatures as they ripped through the rest of the lab. The dog-like monsters tore the lab staff apart and injured Dr. Owens in the process. Then, in retaliation, the psychic girl closed the gate between the worlds. In doing so, she removed the threat of the monsters tearing Dr. Gears limb from limb as they had so many others, but the damage was done just the same. 
If that wasn't bad enough, a tape of Dr. Owen speaking candidly about the lab's activity was leaked to the local media, and the laboratory was promptly shut down for good. With it, it seemed all of the Foundation's access to the anomalies in Hawkins were lost. Still, in spite of these new obstacles, Dr. Gears refused to give up. There were terribly strange things afoot in Hawkins, and he had been sent there to uncover them. He was going to continue to do his job until some authority told him otherwise. Besides, he had gotten quite used to living undercover in this little town. He didn't get out much, but he hadn't gotten out all that much before Hawkins either. It was nice to settle into small town life, where very little ever changed, until the Starcourt Mall opened. Local businesses began to close, disrupting Dr. Gears' routine and causing him a great deal of irritation. And then, of course, there was the matter of the secret Russian laboratory beneath that mall, which unleashed a malevolent entity from the Upside Down into the town. The Foundation team watched as, yet again, the familiar group of civilians neutralized the threat and closed the gateway to the other world. Several of Dr. Gears' assistants suggested interrogating the civilians, or at the very least giving them amnestics to make them forget what they had seen. Dr. Gears, ever the stickler for the rules, reminded them that they had been given strict orders not to interfere. If the threat moved outside of the bounds of Hawkins, that would be one thing. For now, it seemed fairly well contained. In fact, it seemed as if all of it might be over for good. The Byers family left town for California, and life in town settled back into a mundane rhythm. Or at least it did, until the murders began. First, a well-liked cheerleader found mutilated in a trailer. Then, an ambitious student reporter. The town flew into chaos, blaming anything they could think of for the horrific losses. Dungeons & Dragons, the misunderstood tabletop role-playing game, was a convenient scapegoat. But of course, Dr. Gears knew better. This was the influence of something from the other side, something not of this plane. If only he could get back through the gate and finally take a look for himself. Dr. Gears was not a praying kind of man, but his quiet wishes were answered when one of his men returned to headquarters after taking a swim in a nearby lake. He ran through the door, still sopping wet. Sir, <sighs> he panted. You're gonna wanna see this. Please get a towel first. Dr. Gears insisted. You're dripping all over the floor. It's hardwood. Show some decency. After the man was sufficiently dry, Dr. Gears brought the team to investigate the lake. There at the bottom of the water was an ominous red glow. A gate. He couldn't be sure how or why it had opened on its own down there, but an opportunity had finally presented itself. He called his superiors at the Foundation, suited up in protective gear complete with pistols and waterproof communication systems, and dove down into the water, three officers right behind him. The other three would remain on the other side, ready to call for backup or swiftly flee town if anything went sideways. Finally, Dr. Gears would lead an expedition into the Upside Down. As I swam toward the bottom of the lake, into the gate to the unknown, writhing black tendrils slithered out from the opening, snaking around the three men accompanying him and yanking them through. Dr. Gears was an excellent swimmer, the monotony of laps in his local pool being one of his favorite ways to maintain top-notch physical shape, and he sped through the water after them. When he entered the gate, he suddenly emerged into a dark facsimile of the world he had just left behind. He peered through the visor of his suit, taking in his surroundings. It was a cold, shadowy landscape, shaped vaguely like Hawkins, but alien and foreboding. More of those vine-like tentacles curled along the ground, and gray spores drifted through the air like falling snow. The cries of strange creatures filled the air, drowned out only by the pained screams of the three men he had followed through the gate. Dr. Gears looked around for the source of the sound and spotted it. The three members of personnel were struggling to free themselves from the grip of the ropey tendrils that had pulled them inside, and as they did, winged creatures were descending on them from above on all sides. They vaguely resembled bats with flapping leathery wings, but their faces, their mouths, were completely unlike anything Dr. Gears had ever seen with the exception of the other monsters that had crossed through the rift from this place and into his own world. These bat-like creatures were swarming his team, biting at their flesh as the men helplessly tried to fend them off. There was only one thing left to do. Dr. Gears drew his weapon and fired into the sky at the teeming mass of wings and teeth. The bat things reacted and turned their attention to him. His marksmanship did not miss, however, 
and he managed to take out a dozen or so of the vermin before his men could free themselves and come to his aid. Two of his men, at least. One, unfortunately, succumbed to his wounds and would have to be left behind. It was a shame, of course, but he knew what he was signing up for when he joined the ranks of the Foundation. It was then that Dr. Gears remembered something else he had brought with him, inspired by the victory he had witnessed all that time ago. The only thing that had sent the monster back to hell was fire, so he strapped a Foundation-issued flamethrower to his back. He drew this secondary weapon, the flamethrower, and sent a blast of flames soaring through the air, barbecuing the bats to a crisp. With the threat dispelled, at least temporarily, he beckoned the men to follow him through the unforgiving landscape, making note of everything he saw. For each and every detail that made Hawkins memorable, there was an equivalent to it here, covered in those strange spores and a layer of palpable malice. As the group made their way through the Upside Down, Dr. Gears at the front, they spotted what appeared to be the remains of the teenagers whose deaths were being investigated by the town. They were bound up in the vines left on display, but by what, or more likely, by who? Dr. Gears could not see any other sign of human life here. As his mind began to wander, running through the possibilities, something caught his attention. A long, loud, clear sound like the ringing of church bells. No, not quite. Like the chime of a grandfather clock, it rang once, twice, three times, a fourth. He couldn't see a clock anywhere, but the sound appeared to be coming from a massive house up ahead. Nestled within the trees, the eerie red light just barely illuminated the place's silhouette, but as Gears and his remaining two assistants approached, he could see that it was a stately home now in obvious disrepair. He had somehow missed its earthbound equivalent and had never seen the place before, but here it was, the door standing open, as if beckoning him inside. Wait here, keep watch, he nodded to the officers behind him. I'll take it from here. With the pistol in one hand and the other poised and ready to draw the flamethrower at a moment's notice, he stepped into the house. He was right to have his weapon drawn. No sooner had he stepped inside that the vines coiled around his ankles, one winding around his throat and squeezing. With a few quick shots, he was able to force them to recede and continue his investigation. He climbed the creaky stairs to the attic, looking for signs of new life. He briefly thought of trying to use his communicator to check in with the men on the other side, but when he pressed its buttons, it only emitted white noise. It was a favorite sound of his, one he vastly preferred to to the cacophony of music, but now was not the time. He switched it back off and carried on alone. Then, just as he crossed the threshold into the attic, he heard it again, the chime of the clock. In the corner of his eye, he spotted it, an antique grandfather clock. Before he could react to that, though, he heard a voice behind him. Daddy? He turned to see a little girl staring up at him. Why are you leaving us? Don't you love us? He was too stunned to speak. The little girl's eyes turned white, her face dripping like melting wax as she repeated, Why did you leave? Why? 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 He couldn't explain it, but his heart began to pound. He could taste blood in the back of his throat. Behind the little girl, a figure emerged. Human in shape only, a twisted face and form made of exposed muscle and more of those awful tentacle vines approaching him slowly. It haunts you, doesn't it, Doctor? What you did to your family? The figure asked in a menacing voice. Finally, Dr. Gears found the ability to speak again. This all seems like a bit much, don't you think? He didn't have much patience for pageantry of any kind, and he certainly didn't appreciate this. What is this, some sort of psionic mind prison? The entity that Dr. Gears had no name for, but those determined kids from Hawkins knew as Vecna, tilted its head to the side quizzically. I can see your heart. I know the darkness within you, it hissed. Dr. Gears reached down for his communicator, giving it one more shot as the entity approached him with slow, threatening steps. As it reached its fingers towards his face, he flipped a switch and that lovely white noise blared to life. Suddenly, the little vision of the girl was gone. The clock stopped chiming. Vecna was still there, though, glowering at Dr. Gears with a mixture of fury and just plain irritation. I have more important things to attend to than you. Go back to your world while you still can. With a flick of his wrist, Vecna threw Dr. Gears back down the stairs and out the front door of the house where his assistants were still dutifully waiting. 
Dr. Gears was preparing to inform them of his discovery when he heard several new voices in the distance, human and familiar. Those same children were back, once again seemingly to save the day as they had so many times before. Ever the pragmatist, Dr. Gears brushed himself off and headed back in the direction he came. Best to stay out of their way. Shortly after, Dr. Gears and his task force withdrew from Hawkins, Indiana, returning to their original Foundation sites. They could monitor the situation from afar, and in the meantime, leave Hawkins to the U.S. government, the Russians, and that constantly surprising group of brave, clever civilians. Hell, maybe a few of them could be recruited to join the Foundation when they got a bit older. When asked to submit an official report on his findings in Hawkins and his recommendation for how the Foundation should proceed with the situation there, Dr. Gears simply wrote this. To be completely honest, I think those kids have got it covered. Now go check out SCP-096 vs. Siren Head, and could SCP-682 be contained in the back rooms for more anomalous crossovers that are out of this world?